Namaskaram everyone. Welcome to my first talk in a series on the scientific mechanisms of the spiritual path. Ask me all the questions you want, but this talk is structured to fit a huge variety of topics into exactly an hour, so Q&A will be afterwards. So write down all your questions and I'm going to stay behind as long as it takes to answer all of everybody's questions. You can make notes if you like, but you don't need to. This is going to be posted on our YouTube channel, Yoga Shakti Yoga Center, for your reference. Links to the chapters in this video and links to sequel videos, plus links to things I talk about in the video are all available down in the description. Modern people need to know how things work to believe in them. If something is outside our experience, we can't accept it unless we believe that we understand it. While there's not a single thing in existence which science knows in its entirety, we satisfy ourselves that we understand it well enough to believe it. It's my wish that sharing some of this understanding will bring people to a spiritual path of their choosing who otherwise may have disregarded it. Yoga and Buddhism by far have created the greatest number of enlightened beings, but they are not the only systems. It is also important to know that Gautama the Buddha was a yogi and that Buddhism is a form of yoga. It is also my wish that for the small percentage of the population who are already genuinely on a spiritual path, that even someone on the bhakti path which is Sanskrit for devotional. Even a bhakti seeker may become more connected to their path and practices by knowing and understanding how some of it works. I'm the first type. The scientist in me didn't believe any of this, just ancient superstition and tradition, until I started learning how it worked. So I hope this helps some of you either decide to come on to this path or deepen your connection to it because it has been truly transformational for me in a very short time. Even if you are already extremely devout, a real mechanical understanding can deepen that connection to your devotion and practice. Swami Vivekananda said that knowledge itself is the highest reward of knowledge and secondly, there is also utility in it. People think yoga means dressing in synthetic tights and bending into poses. This is wrong in every sense. This is a commercialized exercise regimen with no higher spiritual possibilities unless you get a very rare teacher trained in the traditional ways. Even true Hatha yoga is a very small piece of a system of 112 paths each filled with countless practices that have nothing to do with twisting your body into poses and look nothing like what an average person thinks yoga is. Yoga is a Sanskrit word that means union. With enough work, anyone can come to a state where you experience the union of yourself with the divine. In this state, you experience all of existence as part of yourself. You feel every person, every creature, every tree, rock, thing, as if it were part of your core self, who you are. And you're no longer able to tell what's you and what's not you. When a person reaches this state, knowing experientially that they are one with everything, only then that person is a yogi. Simply practicing yoga, even if it's real yoga, does not make you a yogi. Until a person becomes a yogi, they are a sadaka, a spiritual seeker, the root word being sad or sad, meaning spiritual. Once you know that you are everything and everything is you, systems of morality become useless. A person doesn't need to be told thou shalt not 
if they already know that they're doing it to themselves. For this reason, yoga is compatible with all religions because it's not a religion at all. It's 112 paths, each of numerous technologies to elevate the human system based on profound understandings of the mechanism of the way the human system is put together. Because of Hinduism's dialectical nature of storytelling, it has become very intertwined with yoga as a way to express teachings to what was a much simpler people of antiquity. The ability to understand complex scientific concepts is a pretty modern phenomenon thanks to systematic education. This dropping of the illusory reality and connecting with true reality, or asatoma, as we just said a minute ago, and we also said it in English in that prayer, to reality from illusion, is experienced as an extreme always-on ecstasy due to, among other things, a very steep increase in endocannabinoid <coughs> production in the brain. This is especially interesting because the word ecstasy comes from the ancient Greek, meaning roughly to stand outside of. And when you reach the state where you're distanced from your body and mind and experiencing your core self and everything is part of yourself, you live in a state of always-on bliss. Swami Vivekananda said, no man can be religious until he has had the same perceptions himself. It can be taken so far that a yogi becomes a nirkaya yogi, losing all sense of body from being so deeply spiritual that the yogi must be cared for like an infant. In the middle are most yogis with one foot still in the physical and one in the divine. Far beyond that, we see other men worshipped as gods in Hinduism. The blue skin is the artist's way of conveying a blue aura, meaning they have total mastery over both their energetic and physical natures, a nearly impossible feat. Some people reach a state of yoga temporarily through the use of psychedelics. While the mechanisms in the brain that cause this to happen are different than what happens to a yogi, Experientially, it can be very similar. Damien Eccles uses the analogy of an elevator taking you up to a party for a short time until the doors close and you come back down. Even still, countless people who have temporarily experienced union by doing this have called it the most significant experience of their life. Unfortunately, doing this can also severely damage your ability to get there permanently through yogic practices. On the other hand, Ram Dass used enormous amounts of LSD to reach a deeply spiritual state until the guru gave him a final push over the line to enlightenment. Agora yogis smoke cannabis and opium for spiritual reasons and offer cannabis in their pujas, taking it as prasad. But the Agora path is for far less than 1% of a people. It's a very unique disgusting path which is what makes it so beautiful. They also eat a paste made of ground cannabis leaves called bong or banga. It's used as an offering and then eaten as prasad, which is Sanskrit literally favor or grace, which means food that has been blessed by being around you while you were worshiping or by sitting the food in an energized space. Either way, it will imbibe those energies, then certain items can be taken back and eaten for a blessing. That's Prasad. Sai Baba smoked from Chilam straight pipes filled with ganja. Ganja to Westerners means weed, but it literally means hemp in Sanskrit. Ganja is made from the leaves of the cannabis indica plant, since cannabis is Latin for of hemp and indica is Latin for of India. Again, that is made from ritually purified leaves, not the flower bud. But in general, use of substances is looked down on, if not condemned by most in the yogic sciences. Now the ultimate union is Maha Samadhi, consciously leaving the body and achieving moksha or mukti, literally meaning 
liberation. That means an end to the cycle of rebirth by merging the individual soul called the Atman back with the Para-Atman or God Consciousness. Any system ending in the word yoga must be a self-contained system of enlightenment. Because of commercialization, many so-called yogas are not spiritual paths at all. In true yoga, the practices that are done, including the asanas or poses which you think of when you hear the word yoga, are done for spiritual and energetic reasons, with the physical fitness simply being a byproduct. Nearly every modern school of yoga is strictly about physical fitness. Because of that, they do things for the wrong reasons and rob you of the potential for spiritual growth. Although some growth can still happen accidentally if the asanas are performed correctly and in the correct order. While most modern systems of yoga are not paths of spiritual growth towards enlightenment, if there is a good instructor, they can still safely offer physical benefits and occasionally offer some minor unintended spiritual growth to the practitioner. While standard commercialized hatha yoga has real physical benefits, the loss of potential for spiritual growth is a true tragedy. And that's the best case scenario. Many modern Hatha teachers are doing real damage to their students' energy and sometimes karma systems, having severe negative impact on them psychologically, energetically, and sometimes physiologically. This is so prevalent that Sadhguru, who was never going to teach Hatha because there are so many easier and faster ways to grow spiritually, but when he saw how it was being done wrong, he started training instructors and has even gotten several very famous yoga teachers to stop teaching by making them understand how what they were doing was hurting the people. There are also fads like hot yoga that are guaranteed to do severe damage just by their very nature and should be avoided at all costs. Out of the endless number of body positions called asanas, 84 have been identified as yogasanas, meaning they advance you towards union. With modifications and variations, this number is now over 600. A spiritual seeker on the Hatha path for enlightenment must properly do 21 of the 84 yogasanas and totally master one of them. The seeker will pick whichever asana is easiest for them as long as it has a vertical spine. So sorry, we're not getting to enlightenment by doing shavasana. In your chosen asana, if the practitioner can keep absolutely perfect body geometry with a still mind for a little under three hours, all of the universe will flow into them the same way that an old TV would get no reception until the antenna was properly adjusted. This means everything from the experience of union to automatic downloads from the Akashic records, letting the yogi know everything in the universe worth knowing. So like this, we see people spending their entire lives trying to master a single pose. Hatha as a spiritual path is one of the newest additions to yoga, even though the asanas did exist before it. And it is only a tiny corner in the back when looked at against the other countless spiritual yogic practices. Most paths are much simpler and faster, and Hatha was created for people who could not get it done any other way. The word Hatha comes from the roots Ha, meaning sun, which represents masculine energy, and Tha, meaning moon, representing feminine energy, with the goal of bringing the masculine and feminine into balance. However, in nearly every Indian language in common usage, the word Hatha means stubborn, adamant, effort, force, exertion, etc. If you sit unmoving for hours, your body screams for a break and your mind tries everything it can to trick you into stopping, but you are adamant that you will not budge. This is the true meaning of Hatha Yoga. I do 
quite a bit of karma yoga, karma meaning action in Sanskrit. This usually means hard labor, but in reality, any task at all can be used for spiritual growth if done joyfully and single-mindedly. It's about intensity of involvement. Swami Vivekananda said, you will be nearer to heaven through football than through the study of the Gita. Sad Guru says to be a volunteer at home, meaning do your chores with the same devotion that you would do if you were volunteering at the ashram or at a soup kitchen. Everything in the world is cause and effect, meaning that there has to be mechanisms that drive it. A chain reaction of causality that drives what we call the mechanics of how something works. Vivekananda said there is no supernatural, but there are in nature gross manifestations and subtle manifestations. The subtle are the causes, the gross are the effect. So let's start into the very basics of the mechanics of existence as handed down by 40,000 years of attained yogis with mastery of perception who use their bodies as instruments to investigate the universe and the human system. 40,000 years is believed by those who have attained to be the correct number, but at the moment, archeologically, we can only prove 15,000 years with 100% certainty. The basis of nearly everything there is to talk about comes down to vibrations. Simplistically, E equals MC squared means that energy has mass, and mass is made of energy. Therefore, everything in physical existence is vibrating. Anywhere there is a vibration, there is a sound. However, the human brain evolved for survival filters out everything not needed for survival. The human range is far below 1% of 1% of what exists all around us. If you draw a line from New York to LA and say that this line is the entire electromagnetic spectrum, the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum which we can see as light is about the size of a dime. We see Roy G. Biv, that's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, combined into daylight balanced 5,500 Kelvin degree white light, as the sun puts, as our star, the sun puts out. Anything above violet is ultraviolet, and anything below red is an in infrared. Think of some of what you can't see, like x-rays, gamma rays, microwaves, cell phones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, infrared, radio, TV, radar. The list goes on forever, and they're all exactly the same thing as light, just at different wavelengths that your brain has evolved to filter out because they're not necessary for survival. It works the same way with sound. Everything above the frequency we can hear is supersonic, everything below the frequency we can hear is subsonic. This is why the third eye chakra is about perception. Removing the filter that keeps things out of your perception. Because these things are around you all the time. She, va, is what we're talking about. She means no. Va means thing. But it doesn't mean nothing. It means no hyphen thing. Or a thing that is not. You see me because I stop and reflect light. But you also see me because the air between us does not do that. Perceiving that which is outside of your current perception is what Shiva means. If we could see all the flying signals around us, we would probably live very differently. I personally got rid of all my smart home stuff and hardwired anything in my house with the internet to minimize unnecessary vibrations. This is why Adi Yogi was called Shiva, because he was the one who could perceive that which is not. Shama Shakti, this ashram's director who opened us with the prayer, when she asked me to do a lecture, she asked specifically about Narmada stones and Shiva lingams. 
I said there's no way I can fill an hour with that, but we can start there to make sure that it gets covered. The word lingam in Sanskrit literally sign, symbol, or mark. It comes from the root word lena, which means the form as in the fundamental shape that all of reality is built on. That shape is an ellipsoid, which is a 3D oval. Modern science tells us that the ellipsoid is the last form which energy takes before it becomes matter, and the first form it takes when it breaks down from matter back to energy. The Narmada River is one of the most sacred rivers in India now, unfortunately, home to one of the world's largest dam projects. The Tantrics believe a stone from the gods fell from the heavens into the Narmada River at a site called Amkar Manhata, a very interesting name. Up there on the wall behind you, next to Madhiji, is the Amkar. The Sanskrit word for the sound um, spelled A-U-M. In the middle of the Narmada River, on an island actually shaped like an Amkar, is Manhata City. In the city lies Amkar Manhata Temple, or Amkeshwarar, the Lord of Om. On the mainland on the river's southern bank is a sibling temple called Mamleshwar, meaning Lord of the Immortal Devas, or the Immortal Lord. Amkar Manhata is one of the twelve main shrines in India and is one of India's seven most sacred sites. Once per year after the dry season, just before monsoon season, Villagers with oxen and rope pull stones from the riverbed and hand polish them into lingam shape. Sizes collected range from smaller than a dime to larger than a person. Only 20 to 30 very large pieces are taken from the river each year, with the river damming now causing problems for the collection of the stones and skyrocketing prices. Here we have a couple of examples of Narmada. Shiva Lingam Stone. Wow, that is heavier than it looks. <laughs> this is the Ashram's Narmada Lingam. And uh, you already saw it in comparison to my little one. Um, this is not truly ellipsoidal, but it is the most common shape found in extremely large ancient lingams. While my personal Shiva lingam is a true ellipsoid shape, it's much smaller and lighter, meaning much less valuable and much less powerful, despite being the proper shape. According to myth, on Mount Kailash, Shiva gave a priest Sankara five sacred lingams used to fight evil. These stones have been lost to time, but we did see a fictionalized one very similar to this in the iconic scene from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. The main interest are these lighter areas which are the crypto-crystalline quartz, also known as crypto-quartz. The darker red and brown is mostly iron. These stones from the Narmada River have a very unique vibration that energetically charges Rudraksh beads, which is why Rudraksh are placed on lingams during many different pujas. Narmada lingams are used to stimulate and nurture the third eye chakra by placing the lingam between the third eye and crown chakras. The fact that this is the only place on earth where this configuration of quartz gives credence to the idea that this stone is in fact a meteorite as believed. If you wear a mala, you know that they like to uh, spin around on you like this while you're wearing them. So I added a piece 
of Narmada stone here, not polished into a lingam, as a, a counterweight to keep it balanced. And while it's there, it's sort of constantly recharging the beads. It is acceptable to place a stone between the Sumeru bead, which means mountain summit, but more commonly called the Guru bead, between that and the tassel. If you have a lingam at home, you can wrap your mala around it like this. And just let it recharge <coughs> overnight. Swami Moksha Priya has made it clear she does not want personal malas on this altar because you will contaminate the altar's energy with your own, but doing this at home is perfectly fine, just not on this altar right here. In Hebrew, the word Beth El means house of God and denotes a site where a meteorite landed. The holy city of Bethlehem was built around such a landing site and was therefore always a holy site long before Jesus. The lingam is a phallic symbol, and while these two lingams don't need yonis because of their feminine iron content, generally a lingam is inserted into a yoni, meaning womb or vagina. The lingam and yoni combination is another symbol of unifying masculine and feminine energies. Outside here in the Shiva temple, we all know the 13 black marble Shiva lingams. However, because they are all a single piece of stone rather than a lingam placed into a yogi, many do not consider it a lingam only because half of the ellipsoid actually exists. Fortunately, this does not detract from their main function. These are carved from a single piece of solid black marble. Marble is one of the best, if not the best, stone for absorbing and exuding absorbed energies and vibrations. Also, we all know that the color black absorbs the full spectrum of energies. So black marble Shiva lingams, which are kept in good environments and are well worshipped, will imbibe and resonate those energies back, which can create a powerful energetic space that mirrors the devotional energy it has been given. This property of marble is why Hindu temples statues are carved from marble. And Durgaji over here is solid marble. I believe uh, Ganesh here is marble. Well, they're not in the camera frame. <laughs> Lots of the ones back there are also marble. <laughs> uh, these marble lingam yoni combinations can only charge Rudraksh with the energy it is soaked up versus the natural resonance which the Narmada stone puts out and charges them to a completely different state. During the worship of lingams and all stones, full fat milk and ghee or clarified butter is rubbed all over the stone, allowing fat to soak into the pores of the stone to maintain it from cracking. It is then rinsed with water. The yoni acts as a trough for all the fluids which flow out of the yogi and into a container where the milk and water that runs off is fed to a fruit tree. All right. Let's talk about the spiritual capabilities of metals and sympathetic resonance. Know that the same concept also applies to everything that vibrates aka everything there is. So you can apply this knowledge to the stones we just covered. Sympathetic resonance works like this. Let's say it's already time and someone is over on that bell, just banging it as hard as they can like they want everyone in the room to lose their hearing. Now on the other side of the room, let's put another bell, but it's just hanging there. No one is touching it. As the vibrations from the first bell keep hitting the second bell, after a little while you will see that the second bell is ringing also. As it's taking on those vibrations and causing it to resonate the same signal in sympathy. 
Just as different stones have varying capabilities for storing energetic programming, metals do too. At the top of the list, copper is the absolute best metal for retaining and repeating programming. Gold is next, then silver, and maybe brass next. Uh, this copper ring is consecrated by a guru, but so is this wood rude rock. Actually, this bangle is a perfect example. Underneath this inch and a half image of Devi Bhairavi is a small stone that's been consecrated by a guru. Then it is fitted into this large copper bangle, which, though it's not consecrated, it is in sympathetic resonance with the consecrated stone. It's picking up the vibrations of the stone and in turn it is vibrating as if it were consecrated itself. Remember, E equals MC squared. So all mass is made of energy. All energy is vibrating and everything has a different vibration according to its makeup. Plant energy is always good energy and naturally the more mass there is, the more vibrations there are making the vibration more powerful. So bigger is always better. One plant in particular is very special, the enlightenment tree. We call it the people tree in Hindi or the Bodhi tree in Sanskrit and Pali. Bodhi means Buddha and Buddha literally means enlightenment. Its scientific name is Ficus religiosa, the sacred fig. This is a species of tree that Gautama the Buddha was sitting under when he became enlightened. They have very powerful energy that can help transform a seeker just as it did with Gautama. In the next town over at a Buddhist temple is a very large Bodhi tree planted right next to an aluminum structure that they do most of their services under every Sunday. Because that metal structure is right next to the tree, it's picking up the vibrations of the tree and vibrating in sympathy with the same vibrations as the tree, ringing just like a bell. In fact, the vibrations are much more powerful if you sit under the structure close to the tree instead of directly under and against the tree because of the way the structure is ringing on top of being next to the tree's vibrations. Here at the Yoga Shakti Ashram, the energy comes directly from decades of Ma Yoga Shakti pouring her energy into the property almost daily. There are even consecrated prayer books inside the poured concrete foundations of the buildings. As we sit here, everything in all the buildings and even the entire wooded property is resonating with our energy. We're very fortunate to be here in such a powerful space. And we also have a small Bodhi tree just outside this building which several of us are caring for so it will grow big and strong one day. So now that everyone here clearly understands sympathetic resonance, let's come back to this bangle I started talking about before. It's actually a really amazing design if you know the right way to look at it. <clears throat> so it's show and tell time. Who brought something to show and tell? You did. I did. Okay. <laughs> well, normally when a guru consecrates a personal item, no one else should ever have direct contact with it. But I have another one of these bangles here where the consecrated stone is cracked down the middle. So I think it's okay to pass around and you can check it out. Look at it from the inside and notice the stone. The stone touches the skin, but it also is covered in these dimples that add extra skin contact. You apply the same concept to the water cooler in the Sum Temple and you get holy water because the water takes on the energies of the building by sitting in those vibrations. Every vibration in existence must conform to vibrations that are superior to it. And water restructures itself extremely quickly. You should watch Cymatics videos of water listening to music. It's, it's amazing, it's just constantly Every time the music changes in the slightest bit, the geometry that the water creates changes. All right, let's talk about nadis, chakras, and yogic physiology. 
There are 10 types of pranas broken into two categories of five pranas and five upapranas. Today is introductory level stuff, so let's just group all of them together in the word prana. Prana is life force. In Chinese, it's called ki. Most Westerners are familiar with the Japanese pronunciation chi. Your life force is not simply floating around you or moving about in any way it wants to. It's traveling along set, non-physical pathways called nadis. The word nadi in Sanskrit means flow. In traditional Chinese medicine, these pathways are called meridians. Imagine your vascular system being non-physical and carrying non-physical life force instead of blood. It's not 100% accurate, but it's a good visual to help understand. The human system has 72,000 nadis. The left side of the body and the right side of the brain are the feminine, lunar, intuitive, emotional 36,000 nadis. These originate at a main hub called the Ida, starting at the left side of the base of the lowest vertebrae of the spine and crisscrossing its way up the spine until it terminates at the right nostril. The right side of the body and the left side of the brain are the masculine, logical, solar nadis. Those 36,000 nadis originate at the main hub called the Pingala, starting at the opposite right side of the base of the spine and crisscrossing its way up the spine until it terminates at the left nostril. Even modern science knows that the left brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa, and so is every yogi ever in the last 40,000 years. There is also the Sushuma, which sits dormant, running straight up the middle of the spine, but it's a little too advanced for today, and it really doesn't matter anyway since you don't work on it. It just turns on by itself by working on the other stuff. The Ida and Pingala become very blocked up and require regular sadhana, usually specific alternate nostril breathing techniques to allow the prana to flow out of the main hubs once you break up the blockages. Most yoga systems call the main practice for this nadi shuddhi, meaning energy channel purification. Here at Yoga Shakti, we use the Rishi Garanda Samhita manual called Yoga Syzygy, which calls it Sukha Pravaka Pranayama, or easy preceding mastery of life energies. While Garan mysteriously adds a rhythmic breathing pattern to what he called Nadi Shuddhi. In either case, it's an Upa Yoga practice. Instructions are available on YouTube. If you need help finding them, just ask me after this. All 72,000 Nadis meet in only one place in the body, the Manipuraka or the navel slash solar plexus chakra, and then redistribute themselves across the body. The sound, ah, uh, is the mantra for the manipuraka. Just make the sound and you will feel the reverberation by your navel. Go ahead if you like. This sound carries the vibration across the entire body by way of all 72,000 nadis because of its situation and that is the only point in the body where all 72,000 nadis meet. So if you're giving yourself mental affirmations, a few ahs uh, sends it out to every cell in the body. Stick to a sacred number like seven. Anytime three nadis meet, they create a triangular shaped intersection which creates a chakra that is partially physical and partially non-physical. A chakra, despite being triangular, is a Sanskrit word literally meaning circle, but is usually translated as wheel because of their behavior. As the energies come and meet, they start spinning. Chakras that spin clockwise push energy out of the body, while ch chakras that spin counterclockwise pull energy in. There are various practices to change your chakra speeds, but that's also not for today. Most people are aware of the seven primary kundalini chakras. Kundalini is Sanskrit for coiled. 
This energy is blocked from rising past the root chakra by a knot called the Brahma Granthi between the root and sacral chakras. And a great deal of the work that you do on the spiritual path is to raise the coiled up Kundalini energy from the root chakra up to the crown. So everybody thinks there are seven chakras. In reality, there are 114 chakras in the human system. Two are outside of the physical body. The remaining 112 arrange themselves into seven distinct dimensions, with 16 aspects of each dimension. These seven dimensions are the seven primary Kundalini chakras, but in reality are actually 21 chakras, as each of the seven Kundalini chakras actually have separate corresponding Ida, Pingala, and Sushuma chakras, with each set of three chakras functioning as a single unit. While these chakras have physical manifestations in the body, they also have subtle manifestations called kestras, meaning a place where someone resides. The internal ones are called antar kestras, and the external kestras, which are more exuberant, are called baya kestras. Unfortunately, the modern colors ascribed to the seven kundalini chakras are completely wrong. So for this next part, I'm going to gray out the chakra colors. Starting at the geographical bottom, the root chakra, properly the muladhara, which literally means root of existence, is at the very base of the spine at the perineum, midway between the genital and anal orifices. The muladhara is incorrectly represented in red in modern chakra charts. In fact, the true color of the muladhara is yellow. Your kundalini energies are blocked from passing the muladhara by the Brahma Granthi knot, stopping them from reaching the sacral chakra. This chakra is about your most basic survival processes. So if your muladhara energies are dominant, food and sleep become the most important aspects of your life. But transforming this chakra can make you absolutely free from the processes of food and sleep. Above that, at the sacrum, is the Shvadhisthana, literally where your being is established, known in English as the sacral chakra, located at the sacrum. This chakra is about reproductive energies, making another chakra that is strictly about survival. When the sacral is dominant in your system, pleasures become the most dominant thing in your life. Above that is the Manipuraka, or Manipura, literally city of jewels the energy center of fire at the solar plexus chakra at the navel. Another chakra about survival processes, this is the maintenance center of the body, where you are attached to the umbilical cord, and is ascribed to the element of Agni, or fire, which includes digestion, the electrical firings that make your body and brain run, metabolism, and more. It is also responsible for the egoic identity, which exists strictly for survival. When the Manipuraka is dominant, you will become a very active person who gets things done. The Manipuraka is the only place in the body where all 72,000 nadis meet. Above that is the middle chakra, the Anahata, literally unhurt or unbeaten. We call the heart chakra. This is located at the soft spot just below where the ribs meet at the base of the sternum. When this chakra is dominant, you become very creative. When the Anahata is active, you become very aware of the endless varying shades of color. The lower three chakras are strictly about survival processes, the upper three are strictly spiritual, and then in the middle is the symbol of one triangle facing up and one triangle facing down. This is why the symbol has become widely used by so many religions. Next up from that is the Vishuddhi, literally especially pure, the throat chakra. When this becomes dominant, you will become very powerful. When Shiva drank poison, he stopped it at his throat. So when the throat chakra, the Vishuddhi, is active, the poisons of the outside world, like hate and mistreatment, are filtered out. Next is the Agya, literally perceive, command, or authority. This is your third eye, which is located between your eyebrows. Just like the rest is incorrectly colored, this chakra's true color is orange. When this becomes dominant, you gain intellectual realization which brings you peace and stability. When active not just physically but also spiritually, it enables the perception of that 99% of existence around you that is currently outside of your perception. 
Seekers engaged intensely in sadhana towards the third eye wear orange because that is the true physical color of the chakra, not just the symbolic color. It's the actual physical color of the chakra. Finally, the sahasrara, literally thousand petal, referring to a lotus blossom. That's your throat chakra. Once your energies reach here, you become completely ecstatic for no reason and without external simulation. Simply being connected to the divine leaves you extremely high all the time as the brain produces massive amounts of endocannabinoids that make the strongest cannabis look like child's candy. Since the compound is not THC but a different cannabinoid that you are meant to have, this is experienced with absolutely no dulling of the mind at all and even greatly sharpening the senses and does not cause any of the anxiety related to cannabis use. There is no set path from the third eye to the crown, so it is called falling upward, like jumping into a bottomless pit. Many yogis get stuck just before here, lacking the complete trust it takes to jump off the cliff with their guru to the final step. Activating these 21 or 7 chakras by themselves will lead to physical, psychological, and emotional completion of your survival processes, but do nothing for you energetically or spiritually. This is where the asanas which make up but existed before hatha yoga, when used correctly, can activate the entire system. So again, two of the 114 chakras are outside of the body. Of the remaining 112, four are never worked on because they'll blossom on their own by working on the remaining 108. And there's that magic number again, 108, the most important sacred number in all of numerology. Most of the chakras that are in your body are actually in your hands. Creating mudras with your hands connects different chakras that change the way energy flows by creating energetic circuits. Prayer mudra is a very special one because by matching the identical chakras from the left and right hands against each other, your energies flow in a loop and the Ida and Pangala can balance themselves with enough time and consistency of holding it. This is why you see people walking around just holding prayer mudra. Alternatively, touching other people at all is bad and creates a type of karmic entanglement called Bandha, which is Sanskrit for contract of debt from the root word bandha, meaning lock, which we won't get into today, but we will say that holding hands and shaking hands causes a great number of the chakras in both people to exchange energies in unpredictable ways that vary from having no control over what the energies of the other person are like to not even really controlling which chakras you're connecting to each other. So the energy flow is going to be completely random. These are a couple of the reasons why Indian people traditionally bow as a greeting instead of shaking hands, hugging, kissing, or otherwise having physical contact. There are also several chakras in the feet and an entire science of where and how to touch a guru's feet to access his power. Although most people dive and grab at guru's feet without a clue about how to do it right. Think of all the acupuncture points in the feet. This works because of all the meridian channels and chakras running through the feet. Does everybody know the story of Swami Vivekananda? He was a scientist, not by trade, but by nature. He went around as an 1800s myth buster, disproving pseudoscience of the day. One day when he was 18 and full of questions, that would have been 1881, everyone told him that to get his question answered, he must go to a guru named Ramakrishna. So he went to him and asked, can you prove there is a God? And can you make me experience it? Ramakrishna put his foot on Vivekananda's chest and put him into a state of samadhi for hours. Samadhi is Sanskrit for total self-collectedness, meaning that you are connected to the higher states of reality in absolute mental concentration while still bound to the body, and typically losing all sense of time, experiencing hours, days, weeks, or more as mere minutes. Vivekananda went west and became the first teacher of yoga in America. 
So it is a common sight to see people dive for Guru's feet, trying to grab them without any actual understanding of how to do it so it actually works. If you've ever seen said Guru in person, before each time he comes out, his people make a special announcement about leaving his feet alone. He hates it so much when people do that without permission that he calls it molesting his feet. So the Muladhara is not really red, it's actually yellow. And the third eye, the Sahasvara, is not really indigo, it's actually orange. Now let's talk a little bit about color itself. What color is my shirt? Just shout it out. Yellow. According to modern physics, you literally can't be more wrong. The answer is that my shirt is every color except yellow. When light hits the shirt, or anything at all that is physical, it absorbs all the colors that it is and reflects away what it's not. Remember all that Vedanta, that everything is Maya, or illusion. It doesn't mean the world isn't real, even though modern science is actually starting to say that. That's really not important. You're here, so it doesn't matter. What it means is that everything about your experience of it is illusion, because it's filtered through your faculties, thoughts, experiences, and even laws of nature. Around 70 to 80 percent of wrongful convictions are due directly to eyewitness testimony because different people experience the exact event differently and even contradictorily due to a phenomenon called the Rashomon effect. Named for Akira Kurosawa's classic 1950 film based exactly on this. The colors we see are only one tiny aspect. But try your hardest to imagine everything you see is every color except what you see. The closest we can even comprehend would be a negative from a film camera, and that's not even close to accurate, but it's still helpful. Whatever color you reflect away is added to your aura, so wearing the color that corresponds to a particular chakra adds the energies that work best for that chakra to your system. This is one aspect as to why many aesthetics spend their lives naked, so they do not add any more baggage to themselves that they have to work out. Because they understand what they're already carrying around that needs to be worked out is already substantial. When that is not socially acceptable, they will wear a simple loincloth and nothing else. So for the 99% of us unattained seekers, yellow is the best color you can wear on top giving you the type of energies that do the most good for where you are on the path. Gautama the Buddha, in order to raise consciousness on a widespread scale, never stayed in a town for more than a day. As he did this, converting people to monks, they were given yellow robes because the processes they were given at the initial stages were very simple because of the time he had available to spend with them. And because the color yellow, the actual physical color of the root chakra did not require any preparation. This laid out a slow path to be walked over several lifetimes because the process was about stabilization, not realization. Those of us practicing in modern times have access to teachings for longer than a day, but yellow is still important to wear because it helps stabilize the system to prepare it for more advanced processes that push us towards realization. Remember that the physical aspect of the Muladhara is actually yellow. The Muladhara is the most basic chakra in the body, and working on this chakra helps stabilize the platform for everything else to come. Later, when the Buddhist monks moved on to becoming arhats, or enlightened monks, the word being Sanskrit for one who is worthy, the arhats changed from yellow to okra dyed orange robes, as orange adds the type of energy to your aura that works with the third eye chakra, the chakra of enlightenment. It is also the color of the Kriya Yoga path and the color of renunciation, signifying that you have dropped everything and completely dedicated yourself to the spiritual path. You've dropped your family, material possessions, security, money, and your entire past. After the Buddha died, the Buddhists changed to maroon robes to distinguish themselves from the sannyasi yogis that were nearly 30% of the Indian population at the time, forgetting why they wore orange in the first place. All 112 chakras in the body are partly physical and partly non-physical, 
and each one corresponds to a certain color, even if that color is outside of your range of perception. The two outside the body do not have a color that they correspond to because they are completely non-physical and therefore do not reflect light, so they cannot have a color. So we know the seven primary colors that make up the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. The eighth color, white, or Atvarang, is both no color and all seven colors combined, symbolizing that it is all inclusive. We all know that white reflects everything away and black absorbs everything. So white should be worn for the pants, blocking all energies from entering the chakras below the waist. Those who are not ascetic, wishing to walk the spiritual path but still be involved in other aspects of life, will wear white so they can be involved in life without gathering anything extra that needs to be worked out. At the same time, wearing all black in a powerfully energized space like this where you want to imbibe the energy is the right thing to do. So here at the ashram, black is a great color to wear if you change into it when you get here and out of it when you leave. One should only wear black when you are absolutely sure about the quality of the space you're in. Now much more important than the color of your clothing is the material. Natural fibers that come from the earth are absolutely critical. That could be cotton, linen, flax, silk, hemp, wool, bamboo, eucalyptus, etc. Synthetic fibers are extremely destructive to your aura and energy system. If that's not good enough for you, you should know that most people are walking around with several ounces of polyurethane in their blood from synthetic materials like polyester and nylon in their clothing, bedding, and flooring. On top of that, because these polyfibers are so flammable, they are coated with fire retardant chemicals to make them fire resistant. These chemicals are known to be carcinogenic or cancer causing, in addition to causing thyroid problems, autism, and numerous other ailments, especially in children under 15 years old. Getting rid of synthetic flooring, bedding, and clothing can be one of the most important things you can do for yourself physically and energetically. Add to that another less important layer of whether these natural fibers were grown organically and what kind of dye was used and try to shop for clothes and it's not possible. It's possible to find natural fibers that are the right color for what you're trying to accomplish, whether it's reflecting energies away from you or gathering certain types of energies to help you. And if you really try, you can find them that are grown organically, but you're not going to find anything that's dyed uh, with plant material. So we wear white pants to reflect energies away from the lower chakras. But that's also the same reason why we sit with our legs crossed. Whether it's basic Sukhasana that I'm doing right now, or if we're in a chair, simply crossing the legs at the ankles, right over left. This manipulation of the energy system helps block external energies from entering the lower chakras regardless of the color pants you're wearing. Combining this with white clothing is especially effective. There are also times when we want to block energies from entering the higher chakras as well. Wearing a white top is the main way, but also crossing the arms in a defensive posture works the same way as crossing the legs. Crossing the arms in this way is called Vida Matan Mudra. Now we've looked at how color works, let's look at a real world example. A terrible social practice is wearing black to a funeral. The black soaking in all the negative energies when the proper thing to do would be to wear all white and lots and lots of rude rocks to create a cocoon of your own energies to block outside influences. So next time you're at a funeral, wear all white and sit in back like this and I guarantee you you'll be the most popular person there. Everybody will be talking about you. Additionally, eating with your legs crossed is also important to not allow energies in. With your legs crossed, there is an added benefit to eating with a table between you and the food that also helps block the energies. But sitting on the floor and eating with your legs crossed is even better. The absolute worst thing you can do is eat standing up. Either way you sit, approach your food with gratitude and, as much as possible, 
use your hands instead of utensils. Both of these things will greatly change the way the food behaves in you. There isn't time to be more detailed than that today. Elemental memory is a long, complex subject for another time, and we've just hit our hour. We're going to do our three closing ohms. For yoga mudra, you do this. This is wrong, okay? This space right here, you want to make sure all four of the digits across are contacting. And then from there, only touch the very tips. All the tension should be from the fingers to the wrist. Any tension above the wrist will cause the energies to flow backwards and do the opposite of what you want. So let's hold a yoga mudra and we're going to ohm three times. Remember with the sound ah, oo, and um, as we just showed you earlier up on the ohm car. Yeah, this is the first of a series. There's uh, a lot more science to come. So if you're interested in knowing how these things work, stick with me. Some of these lectures are going to be like this, where several topics are just going to get hit a little bit. Then I'm going to do some things on uh, possibly rude rocks, on water memory, where there may be several lectures just on that one subject. Probably going to do a series of these once a month, correct, Chris? I, I, I don't know if uh, I'll commit to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it took me about a month to put this together. I need a break. <laughs> but th th there will be a series. Uh, it's very informative. I mean, we like it. Let's do this Q&A, anything at all. I think knowing how these things work, if you don't do them, it can bring you to it. And if you do do them, it can, can connect you to it in a deeper way than you already were. So what's the goal? The goal. Do you remember the Vivekananda quote I gave you at the very beginning? Say, say it again. Knowledge itself is the highest reward of knowledge. And secondly, there is utility in it. Are you saying knowledge for knowledge's sake? Well, he's saying that. Uh, I'm saying that if you do something every day, you're a bhakti guy. You do something every day and you don't understand how it works, but your devotion to it, you just, you, you do it with your whole heart. Knowing how that functions can bring you a deeper connection to it. You want me to fly around the, in the air now? Because <laughs> that's what will happen. <laughs> if you, you know what's funny is um, what one of the things that happens to yogis as they start to become more powerful and they, they start to pick up these cities, these the kind of superpowers that yogis get, um, they become much less available to gravity. And uh, every year, there's what's called the Flying Yogi Contest, 
where uh, they sit with their legs crossed and they just but flapping their legs, they have to jump over obstacle courses. Now, if you want to fly around, if you want to start flying around, we can get you in some flying. Let's say I'm pretty blissed out now, so. Yeah, <laughs> well, if you're saying you're high instead of uh, actually literally flying, then, you know, you're supposed to be. <laughs> but also, it wasn't all just mechanics that are strictly knowledge. There were several practical things you can use in your everyday life. I talked about not shaking or holding hands, the colors of clothes to wear and why, materials of clothes bedding and flooring, and how they affect you, how to balance your naughty hubs with prayer mudra, um, using rude rocks to block out energies, crossing your arms and legs to block out energies, clothing that blocks out energies, how to handle your food, how to hold yoga mudra, which is commonly done wrong, and other practical things you can take home and incorporate in your everyday life. Not just knowledge for knowledge sake or having a deeper connection to your practice. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. Thank you all for coming and um, once this is up on YouTube, it'll be available for your reference all the time. Uh, you'll see a lot of Moksha Priya videos up there and there's a lot of my Yoga Shakti videos up there that I've converted from VHS and uh, put up on that channel also. There's a ton of uh, my Yoga Shakti content on that channel. Nice. That was very nice. Thank you. Very nice. Did I ever even light this? No, I don't think you did. Oh. <laughs> That's next time. Either. Oh, too much of a hurry. Good job.